Today on Florida Sportsman, Project Dreamboat. The professionals at Two Rivers Boat Works take a look at repairing and customizing a 25-foot contender. It's kind of really a pity that the fuel tanks go just after you've put brand new Mercury's on the boat. At l &H, the Custom 33 Express build gets a touch of gold on the transom. When I got the phone call I was doing Alan Jackson's boat, I was like, yes, that's freaking awesome. I love Alan Jackson. George Labonte joins Alex Gorichki aboard his personalized 1983 24-foot T-Craft. In my world, boats aren't just a boat. It's, it's an extension of us, an extension of our family, and, and the times that you have on it are irreplaceable. And the owner of the 23-foot Seacraft at Wildfire Marine checks in on the progress of his very custom build. For me, it's worth a five and a half hour drive down to make sure all those final details are right. All coming up on Florida Sportsman Project Dreamboat. Join us as we follow one-off builds to all-out restorations in Stewart, Florida's Dreamboat District, home to some of the best custom boat builders in the world. From modest to over-the-top, industry experts from the district's premier facilities show how it's done. Fiberglass repair, custom paintwork, engine rigging, electronics installations, and more. And boating editor George Labonte shares the stories of boaters who have already turned their dreams into reality. This is Florida Sportsman Project Dreamboat. So recently at Two Rivers Boat Works, I was contacted by a gentleman called Mike Poston, who had a 25-foot contender that needed new fuel tanks and some instruments. So I said to Mike, hey, just bring the boat by and let us have a look at it. Uh, the boat's a 2004 uh, Contender 25 Open. Um, I purchased it a few years ago. I um, had the new Mercury's uh, put on it. Um, first trip to the Bahamas, the uh, fuel tanks started leaking. We started smelling fuel in the bilge. We finished the trip, we made it back. Um, so I'm at Two Rivers Boat Works to just get new tanks. And while the tanks are out, we're gonna put new electronics in it and you know do a few other things, new rub rail, just kind of bring the boat um, up, to, up to date. So, you know, when we get a project like Mark's boat in, it is often a really good time to do a little bit of customizing and um, do a few alterations because, you know, we already taking the boat apart. We are already having to paint large parts of the boat because we're cutting the floors out to do the fuel tanks. So I sort of had this discussion with Mark and I got a lot of really positive feedback from him on how he wants the boat. I think this is going to be one of those projects that it's going to really, really come out top notch. You know, since you guys are going to have it and have the, you know, console out, you got to do the non-skid anyway. Yeah. I said no. How much more work would be involved to just, you know, paint the whole thing? I mean, the Joko's in pretty good shape. You got, if you look down at it, you see some, you know, yeah. scratches and things. I said no. That, how much that's fairing? That's cosmetic. Though. Yeah. Perhaps a new rub rail. Yeah, new rub rail. I'm thinking. That's another thing I wanted to talk to you about. It, you know, I like the black. Um, I think it breaks it up a little bit. I don't know white. White. Clean, yeah. White with like you, a stainless you know, insert. If you look, if you, yeah, you can put a stainless or have a look at that. Um, it's white on white. White on white. It looks so clean. You, you've got a good uh, T top. Yeah, we can get in there. I, you know, it's pitted pretty bad, and if I'm, you know, redoing everything, I don't. The pitting kind of just cosmetically yeah. aggravating to me. So. But I mean, this boat's good for years to come, especially with these new motors on. Right. Do you want to leave the motors black? Yeah, I think so. I like the black. I mean, I'm not opposed to the white. I just, you know, I think it just depends how how far we're going to get into it. If we well, paint the, the whole it thing. It depends on how custom you want your boat right. to be. You know, if you're customizing and you're spending a lot of money on the, on the sides and that already, I kind of feel right. Nothing screams custom like custom painted motors. Right. It just breaks you up from everybody else in the crowd. Right, right. One of the things I noticed when Mike and I were walking around the boat was um, his instruments were very, very outdated. You know, they were great instruments in their day, but times have moved on and there's a lot of really good instruments and a lot of smart technology out there at the moment. And I really have some good ideas on cleaning it all up making it look really modern, um, and sort of almost that yacht top finish to it. Yeah, we, we go to the islands in the summer. Um, I like to fish offshore, so 
just the boat being from 2004, it's, you know, there's uh, certain things that make that hard, they like, especially electronics, they're original Ray Marines from 2004. You know, so I think with the new Simrad um, electronics, it'll just make things easier, faster, more efficient. Um, and then I think they'll pair up really well with the Mercury. So it should be, you know, a more complete integrated system when it's all done. It's easy to get excited about sort of the artistic side of making a boat look good. But what we really have to pay attention to is getting this boat safe before we can start having fun and making the boat look really good. When we come back, LNH nears completion on the custom 33-foot express bill. This segment brought to you by Pacer Group, marine-grade electrical wire, components, and systems. For more than 30 years, Pacer Group has been the most trusted provider of wire, cable, and electrical products to the top marine manufacturers. All of our wire and cable is made in the USA to ensure it's the best in the industry. Pacer Group provides the highest quality electrical products to be found at one place. You can order with us at pacergroup.net. Shop online and ship or pick up your web order within an hour at our Hollywood, Florida location. Welcome back to Florida Sportsman Project Dreamboat. Join us as the 33-foot express build at l &H gets a touch of gold on the transom. Um, we've, we've talked to Alan Jackson, the country singer, been in contact with them over a few years. They, they've looked at our l &H 33 and very much liked the boat. A year and a half or so ago, they, they contacted us about doing a custom project with them. They have a, an old boat that they, a family boat that they've loved, uh, a 30-foot um, prowler. They sent us photographs of the boat and, and some very light sketches of the boat and some ideas that Mr. Jackson had had. Um, they wanted to build it on, on our 33 hull, so we, we had the benefit of, of knowing how to build that hull and being able to produce it out of a mold. Relatively simple build. But from there up, everything is going to be custom, everything. We don't have molds for it. The boat is an express style boat, so vastly different from our walk around. Um, everything was built uh, custom. Alan Jackson is a very particular person. He has, he has things that he likes a lot on boats that he, he's owned over time, that he likes to reproduce that. He has other things that are pet peeves that he doesn't want to have on a boat. So our whole thing was to listen to him and try to build him what he wanted. He's got a really good captain that works with him that understands what he wants. So when Mr. Jackson wasn't available uh, firsthand, uh, the captain was, and, and so we worked hand in hand with him. The boat's over at A&J now, and then Monique is going to come in and do the lettering on the transom of the boat. Again, Alan's very particular about the way he wants the transom done, and he's very uh, familiar with Monique's work, so uh, she got the job. Hello, my name's Monique Richter, and I recently did some work for l &H Boatworks and for Alan Jackson for his boat, Good Time. We did a bunch of faux work that makes it look like teak wood, but with paint. And now we're about to do the name, which is going to be in real 23 karat gold. It's an old trade that was passed down to me. Uh, so I have a graphic designer, Emily, who works for my company. And what she does is she makes all the mock-ups for the names. And I'll get a stencil made. So pretty much everything is the same measurements of what they want. That goes on there, and then I apply all the gold. So gold comes in these boxes, like this. And uh, it comes in a packet. There's about 25 sheets per packet. These little babies go for $75 a pop. This particular one is from Italy. I personally prefer Italian gold. It has this nice luster shine to it. So the gold goes on in sections, and you have to make it very uniform, those little squares, else it looks kind of unorganized when you actually do the, the brushing of the gold, the finished product. So after you have all the gold on the back of the boat, then you start using some brushes to wipe off the gold. Like you're dusting the excess of gold off the boat. And gold is flying everywhere. <laughs> and people are like, yes, gold everywhere. But really, it's just uh, little scrap pieces that are flying away. And then you're left with a finished product of what it's going to kind of look like. And it'll be a satin look. So if you wanted to make it into engine turn, then you're basically taking your velvet tools that I make myself, and I'm hand doing them, like little circles, but not too hard where you're gonna burn right through, because it's very fragile. You're just lightly doing it, and it makes this beautiful design. 
that you could change big circles, little circles, however you want to spin it. So after you, you're done with the whole process of the gold, then you're going to want to make it nice and crisp because now what you have is raw edges of gold. So you have to pull that fine line tape so you have a nice perfect edge to paint with. So then you're going to take your fine paint brushes and you're going to outline it just perfect and you can't screw up. If you screw up, you got to start all over. It's not like you could just wipe off the paint because it'll screw up all the gold. So you're like, like holding your paintbrush like this and making sure it's perfect. So once it, I do all the paint on it, I have to wait for it to dry. So I'm just waiting there. And then finally I could unpeel the whole stencil off. It's very exciting. It's like opening a Christmas present. You know, you're untaping it and then you're like, yes, got it done. <laughs> this particular job, I was very excited because it was Alan Jackson. I mean, how cool is that, you know? Good time, so I just can't wait to see Alan enjoying his boat on the water. And I think it's another successful project. All right, well, Monique's finished up with her part of it and everything's come out excellent. We're gonna have to spray clear over that to protect the, the lettering and also to, just to build up a, a more protection for the Fotique transom. Um, but we're ready to splash it and they're ready to go fishing and um, looks like everybody's gonna have a good time. When we return, George Labonte joins Dreamboat owner Alex Goritsky aboard his 1983 24-foot T-Craft in this week's One Man's Dreamboat segment. This segment brought to you by Taco Marine, innovative quality products with extraordinary service. Safety is paramount when boating. That's why Taco developed the Grand Slam 800 VHF antenna mount. Easily raise and lower your boat's antenna by simply unlocking the crank handle from the base and turning. It's quick, easy, and best of all, safe. No more climbing on gunnels, seats, or tops just to adjust your antenna. Find out more about the Grand Slam 800 VHF antenna mount at tacomarine.com. Welcome back to Florida Sportsman Project Dreamboat. Join us for this week's One Man's Dreamboat segment with Florida Sportsman Boating Editor George Labonte as we feature anglers who have already launched their dream. Florida Sportsman began these features 30 years ago, and the dreams just keep getting better. Today we're going to have a look at a boat that's got a lot of history on the east coast of Florida, especially in the Florida Space Coast. Now this is a boat that a lot of you are going to be unfamiliar with, but trust me, the people that do know about these boats are really, really fond of them. The boat's called a T-Craft and it was originally built from the 1960s into the early 1980s in Florida Space Coast, more precisely in Titusville, Florida. And that's where our show brings us today to meet up with Alex Skorichki, who has restored and vintage T-Craft that was once owned by his grandfather and brought it into his needs as a guide in the Space Coast and it's worked out really well for him. My boat is a 1983 24 by 8 T-Craft built locally here in Titusville. It was purchased by my grandfather in 1987 and uh, we actually ran it as an offshore boat for my entire life. It's a boat I grew up fishing on. We. Uh, grew up in a family basically that did nothing but surfed and fished and dove and uh, that was our play toy the whole time. Having so many years on that boat and, and getting to fish that boat and, and so many different types of fisheries and stuff like that gave me a real good insight of what I wanted to do to make that boat what I thought would be the perfect vessel. Now Alex has been a guide up there in the Space Coast for a number of years and he'd been fishing out of a smaller skiff, more commonly associated with the backwater type of fishing. Well at some point he decided he needed a boat that would go offshore and suit his needs on the beach and offshore commercial fishing as well as fish on the inside. After I got it to the house and really got into it, uh, we decided that there were several things that we weren't going to kind of cut corners on. One was that there would be no wood uh, in anything that I redid. We did, however, leave the front deck wood. I almost replaced it, but it had all these beautiful pressure marks in it from me and my brother as kids up there on the bow of the boat and the fun surf and everything else jumping around. So I wasn't gonna take that away. You gotta have a little bit of that soul left in it. Um, everything else was redone with composites. Uh, the whole transom was Cusa board. The floor was done with a Nidacor, um, and we did vinyl ester resin for, for everything and ended up taking uh, an arctic white for the, the gel coat on the, the upper part of the gunnels um, and then also the console and the leaning post all shot there at my house and 
sanded out and buffed out and made it to look pretty. Now, Alex had a lot of experience doing fiberglass work from a job that he formerly had at Sea Ray Boats. But when it came time to really get something that was out of his scope, he was not afraid to ask somebody else for help. Uh, the, the full rewire was done by a local shop here, and those guys did a wonderful job. Uh, we have a relatively local place down in Fort Pierce where I was able to get the leaning post and the console. The leaning post came with a real dinky little 25 gallon, looked like a sink of a live well. And I actually took that out and dropped a 55 gallon uh, drum live well that you would uh, get for a sport fishing boat to stand alone in the back of a sport fisher and managed to wiggle it up inside of there and locked it in. And it's got about 50 gallons worth of live well capacity in it. And then months later found online somebody selling a tower that just so happened to fit about as perfect as you could get. Um, and it's a beautiful kind of custom made tower uh, with the stand through helm and also uh, a full size T-top on it, which was a big thing for me in the offshore world to have that bit of cover. The technology that we've come up against with these trolling motors has really allowed larger boats like a 24 foot offshore boat slash bay boat uh, to, to act more like your typical skiff and to be able to work around docks or work around bridges and tight spaces, the spot lock is obviously a, a, an irreplaceable feature. I ended up going with one single head unit on the dash. It's a 12-inch Lowrance. Uh, we kept everything real simple with every aspect of the dash. We didn't want to clutter too much. And on the day we joined Alex, fishing in the Indian River Lagoon, it was actually blowing pretty hard and a little bit choppy. And as we ran from bridge to bridge looking for something to catch, I could easily see the appeal of this boat for him coming out of a skiff. Now this hull design being so beamy and really offering a lot of stability that you're not gonna get in a skiff, really fit. I mean, for a guy to run around the boat, chasing a fish around and just being on the boat all day, takes a lot less of a toll on you when you're on a boat that's this wide and comfortable compared to being on a little typical polling skiff. In my world, boats aren't just a boat. It's, it's an extension of us, an extension of our family, and, and the times that you have on it are irreplaceable. With this boat, I honestly don't think it'll ever be sold. I really believe that it will be in my family, whether it's in my possession, one of my, my son or my daughter's possession. I don't think that it'll ever go on the market again. It'll probably be a boat that I keep till the very end. After receiving the hull as a gift and performing necessary repairs and custom modifications, the cost of Alex's dream boat comes to a total of $55,000. When we return, the owner of the 23-foot Seacraft meets with the crew at Wildfire Marine as the project nears completion. This segment brought to you by Suzuki Marine, the ultimate outboard. Welcome back to Florida Sportsman Project Dreamboat. Join the crew at Wildfire Marine as they work to finalize the 23-foot Seacraft project. Here at Wildfire Marine, we're getting ready to finish up Corey Fountain's 23 Seacraft project. We had to wait for Corey to come down from Savannah with all his electronics. We want to put everything where it belongs. Uh, everything's easy for the customer to use. And we can't do that unless we have everything that's going to be put on the boat. Um, to me, it is a custom boat, and I want to make sure that the feel of everything is right for me and um, how I'm standing in the boat and how I plan on using the boat. So for me, it's worth a five and a half hour drive down to make sure all those final details are right. A couple of years ago, Corey Fountain called me about doing a 23-foot Seacraft, and uh, he was having a hard time finding a center console. So I told him, well, I have a mold for the cap. So I said, don't limit yourself to center consoles. If you can find a scepter, we can work with that. Once we got the boat here, we, we stripped out the transom. Uh, he wanted to do some forward seating, which we hadn't done before. So we went ahead and, and mocked that up and then built the, the forward seating portion. And we painted the outside of the boat, painted the inside. Uh, 
and then went ahead and dropped the cap on and painted that and put, installed the console. And then uh, once we got to that point, he had Birdsall Marine build him a top and leaning post and they installed all that and now we're getting ready to finish the rest of the boat. Now that Corey's here, we got a hold of Dave from Coastal Marine who's going to be installing the Suzuki 150s on the back of this boat. Dave's going to go ahead and lay out where his controls and gauges have to be and then we'll go ahead and lay out where the rest of the electronics are going to go and between us all we'll get that all set so we can continue on with this project. First thing we discussed when we got up in the boat is uh, where the gauges are going to be placed for Corey to make sure that he could see them. Uh, they wanted to go directly in front of them where they're easiest to read but we wanted to make sure he could actually read them with the steering wheel in place. Now how about when you're, because typically, uh, I mean, when you're running the boat, in a lot of cases you're going to be standing. Yeah. If you stand up, can you see those all right? The steering wheel's right in the middle of them. Steering wheel's <laughs> right in the middle of them. All right. I mean, it falls right dead center. Um, <laughs> Obviously, from Corey's reaction, that uh, original placement of the gauges wasn't going to work, so we had to find another spot for him where he could still read them. So put them like that? I hate, well, I hate that. Yeah, okay. because then you're, you know what's going on, but mm -hmm. somebody fresh coming in here, which mm -hmm. one's starboard, which uh, one's port? Typically you want the port, the starboard, and, and if we're going to do the okay. you know, fuel and speed and everything on the center one. Okay. The next place we tried was in between the uh, GPS and the switch panel, which gave us room to put the, both the port and starboard gauges side by side, and the fuel management gauge down below that. Uh, it was important to keep the port and starboard engines lined up, so it's very easy to associate which gauge is for which engine. Do you like that angle too? Yeah, that's perfect. I really want to crook it. Yeah, it's definitely. In case you're yeah, listing. we typically try to put them in crooked. <laughs> yeah. And then, then you can, that way you can keep all these the same height. I do like that better. I mean, since we have enough room, I think I'll like that better yeah. than looking through the steering wheel at it. Now, were you looking through the steering wheel at them when this was up here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Even, even at that position, a little bit. I mean, not through the steering wheel, but just kind of like, yeah. sure. not really like heads up. Sharp angle. Yep. Yeah. So, so to me, this makes a little bit more like glance and still not, lo not looking so far down, you know? Absolutely. We got all that stuff set, and now we can go ahead and, and move forward with uh, our wiring and installing our gauges. And uh, everything will be ready for Dave. We won't be in Dave's way when he starts putting on all of his equipment for the motors. Um, it looks like that we should be done by around March 1st, so right in time for the season in Savannah. Uh, weather starts to warm up up there, so I'm looking forward to getting in the water. Next week on Florida Sportsman Project Dreamboat, the 25-foot contender at Two Rivers Boat Works heads south to Birdsall Marine for a custom top. George Labonte joins Tom and Ryan Kilcourse aboard their fully restored 17-foot Mako, and the team at Wildfire Marine gets to wiring on the 23-foot Seacraft project. <laughs>